Welcome, I'm Rick Hassan, Professor of Law at UC Irvine School of Law, and I'm co-director along with Professor David Kay of the UCI Law Fair Elections and Free Speech Center. Established in 2021 after the contentious 2020 US presidential elections, which culminated in the dangerous January 6th uh, insurrection at the United States Capitol, the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center at UCI Law is unique in its focus among US and global institutions it's dedicated solely to advancing an understanding of and offering means to counter threats to the stability and legitimacy of democratic governments, exacerbated by the unregulated growth of digital media and other technological changes in mass communications. Today's event is the second in a three-part series on disinformation in American elections. Uh, the first uh, panel in our series uh, featured election officials, Jocelyn Benson, the Secretary of State of Michigan and the Orange County, California Registrar, Neil Kelly. That was moderated by Tammy Patrick. I'll be posting a link to the video of that first event in the chat. Uh, our uh, final event in this series on November 10th features a conversation on this topic among social scientists. It will feature Renee DiResta, Joan Donovan, and Brendan Nyan, and that will be moderated by Pam Fessler. And I'll put an RSVP link into the chat for those who'd like to attend that event. You can find details about these events and others at the center's website, law.uci.edu slash F-E-F-S, law.uci.edu slash F-E-F-S. Thanks to our staff, including Colleen Terakani, uh, Rabi Kadri, Aaron Hebert, and Anna Iliff for helping to put today's event together. Today's event features a, an all-star lineup of thinkers about issues related to disinformation, the internet, elections, and the risk of voter suppression. I will only briefly introduce our speakers. Their full biographies appear at the center's website. Danielle Citron is the Jefferson Scholars Foundation uh, Schenck Distinguished Professor of Law, Cat Ellen Chapman Professor of Law at the University of Virginia. I guess that's all the time we have for today now that I've finished Danielle's introduction, um, where she writes and teaches about privacy, free expression, and civil rights, her scholarship and advocacy have been recognized nationally and internationally. In 2019, Citroen was named a MacArthur Fellow based on her work on cyberstalking and intimate privacy. She serves as the inaugural director of the uh, UVA Law School's uh, Law Tech Center, which focuses on pressing questions of law and technology. Spencer Overton is professor of law at George Washington University, specializing in election law and campaign finance. He also served in the Obama administration, where he was the principal deputy assistant attorney general of the Department of Justice and the Office of Legal Policy. In that position, he partnered with the White House officials to lead the administration's efforts on democracy issues. In addition to serving as a professor of law at GW, Spencer serves as president of the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, the Joint Center was founded in 1970 as America's Black Think Tank and today produces research and solutions on platform accountability. Spencer is also the author of a review essay, State Power to Regulate Social Media Companies to Prevent Voter Suppression, and has testified before Congress and submitted comments on voting rights disinformation in Section 230. Nate Persley is the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School with appointments in the Department of Political Science, Communications, and FSI. Prior to joining Stanford, uh, Professor Persley taught at Columbia, the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and has been a visitor at Harvard, NYU, Princeton, the University of Amsterdam, and the University of Melbourne. Professor Persley's scholarship and legal practice focuses on American election law. He served as a special master or court-appointed expert to craft congressional or state legislative redistricting plans in a number of states. He also served as senior research director for the Presidential Commission on Election Administration. Quite an illustrious group here. I'm thrilled to have this discussion with, with three people I think are thinking probably the most deeply among legal scholars about issues of disinformation uh, and uh, its connection to American elections. And so I'm gonna open this up and I'm gonna start with you, Nate, with a very broad question. Is disinformation a problem in American elections? And if so, how would you characterize the problem? So thank you, uh, Rick, and thank you all my co-panelists for uh, joining us today. This is a great group. Um, yes, it is a big problem. Um, it is, you know, disinformation, election lies have been with us since we've had elections, um, but there's something new afoot. Um, some of it is internet related, but a lot of it is, is just uh, given the politics right now. Um, I think that what, 
there's a sense in which, at, at the risk of using this phrase, that the Overton window has been expanded, though it's a different Overton than the one uh, uh, that, that we have here, um, uh, in that, that lies have become normalized in our politics in a way that was not true uh, before. And so, he, but here's the way I would characterize the disinformation problem, and, and I'm kind of borrowing from you, Rick, in, the, in some of the writing that you've thought about in, in terms of um, the different stages of the electoral process in which, which lies can happen as well as threats to democracy, that there are lies that happen during the campaign where um, the, the politicians, the, those folks running for office are lying about each other, lying about policies and the like. That's, that's always happened, um, um, although I think it has reached new heights. The second is lies about the process of uh, the election. So for example, uh, targeted disinformation to demobilize voters to say that uh, you know voting is on Wednesday instead of Tuesday and the like. And then there's lies about the results um, and, and particularly propagations as, as you sort of pointed out of false claims of election fraud. And so, um, uh, what we are seeing is a clear partisan division right now in trust in the electoral system. Um, but that, uh, you know, what, when you talk about disinformation, you can't just ignore the big lie, right? And so the big lie over um, who won the election in 2020 uh, is a new phenomenon, right? Um, this level of, of loss of trust in the election um, system um, with all kinds of uh, downstream bad effects is, I think, a new development and one that's quite dangerous for our democracy. And if I could just follow up, uh, dangerous existentially, uh, dangerous in terms of voters making poor choices. So what is the danger that you see? Well, so some of the danger is due to disinformation. Some of it is just the, the danger is because of where we are politically and, and the constitutional crisis that I think we are already in. Uh, and so that I think a, that we are a critical mass of Americans have lost faith in American democracy and the basic mechanics of electoral choice. Uh, and that is a prescription for disaster. I also think that that, is, that group is going to grow and become more bipartisan following the elections next year, um, because I think that there, there's a sense in which this is going to feed on itself, that this loss of trust is going to metastasize further. Now, um, like I said, you know, it, it, whether you characterize this as a disinformation problem, a polarization problem, a kind of crisis of democracy, you know, we can all debate how best to characterize it. We all we just understand what's going on, which is that the electoral system is under attack. It's under attack by way of lies. It's under attack through you know, uh, laws that are being passed. It's under attack um, because of, of uh, crippling polarization. And so um, the disinformation is, is one way of, of talking about it. Um, but what, one thing that, that I'll, I was going to sort of save this for later, but it, there, there are the lies that are being told, but, but it's not just, as we know from other disinformation work, it's not just the lies, right? There are, there are sort of questioning of established institutions. There's um, a delegitimizing of institutions, which are done through kind of misinformation or twisted truths, as opposed to just straight out election lies. All right, let me uh, turn to Spencer. Um, Welcome from Florida, I think, today. Well, uh, thank you. And again, excuse me for not having a jacket and a tie. I always aspire to be my mate uh, here. Uh, so uh, thanks, Rick, for your consistent leadership in election law over the years, including your work in setting up the Fair Elections and Free Speech Center. Uh, I'm also thrilled to be here, obviously, with Amy Danielle. Your work has kicked this deal. Now, now, the problem of disinformation is multifaceted and includes foreign influence, enhanced polarization that hinders deliberation, and also a business model that profits off of anger. We could talk a lot more about any of those things. But the disinformation problem, Rick, that I really want to dig into is disinformation that facilitates discrimination in voting. Uh, you'll remember in January of 2016, the Williams and Calvin Facebook page started operating. Uh, you know, Williams and Calvin purported to be two black men from Atlanta. They started out by doing regular posts on police violence, mass incarceration, and other structural inequalities. They developed a, a major following among black users. And then on election day 2016, 
the operators of that Facebook page paid for and posted a Facebook ad. Uh, the creators of the ad selected Facebook advertising categories that would micro-target Black audiences, such as African American history or Malcolm X. And the ad proclaimed, we don't have any other choice this time but to boycott the election. This time we choose between two races. No one represents Black people. Don't go to vote. Now, after that election, an investigation revealed that the Williams and Calvin Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube accounts were fake accounts set up and operated by the Russian Internet Research Agency uh, here. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Russians did this in mass with various groups, but Black communities were, were heavily targeted. Even though Black folks are only about 13% of the U.S. population, the Russians directed 38% of their U.S. Facebook ad buys toward African Americans, and these ads resulted in 50% of the user uh, clicks uh, total. The Trump campaign deployed a similar strategy, uh, and in 2020, the Russians targeted Black users with online disinformation about Senator, uh, then Senator Kamala uh, Harris. Now, a, a number of social media companies would argue that today this deceptive practices on steroids problem is, is no longer an issue because they'd say, we don't allow political ads around elections. Uh, you know, we don't know the race of our users. And, you know, we have these extensive content moderation uh, operations. Uh, you know, I, I, I disagree. You know, studies show that even when an advertiser isn't trying to limit an ad or target it by race, the algorithms deployed by a company create a racial skew in the delivery of the content, uh, you know, by the, by the platform here. There are other issues of disinformation facilitating discrimination uh, referenced really by, by Nate, you know, disinformation that the 2020 election was rigged has led to voting restrictions that make it more difficult for many communities of color and others to vote. Uh, and, and politicians have, have pushed for new state and federal laws that would discourage platforms from engaging in responsible content moderation so that the politicians are free to promote disinformation that leads to more restrictive voting uh, measures uh, or you know, uh, promote uh, 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 disinformation that discourages uh, voting. So I'll stop with that and, and, and look forward to, to more discussion as we go deeper. Thanks, Spencer. Before I turn to Danielle, I just want to ask, um, going back and thinking about the 2016 activity, so certainly there was um, deception in terms of uh, impersonating. You know, you certainly would have thought, looking at uh, these speakers, that they were African African American uh, voters. Uh, or at least African-American uh, citizens of the United States and not Russians, was the information itself false information? Right. Uh, or was it an opinion that, you know, if an American had uh, said it, it would just be part of the rough and tumble of politics? Yeah, and I think what was false, of course, was the identity uh, here. And this is also the sticky place. I think the Supreme Court has certainly said misinformation about time, place, or manner, like we can definitely regulate that. There's not a First Amendment problem. But there are, honestly, if an American had said this, there are certainly, uh, you know, First Amendment questions about, you know, shouldn't somebody be able to say, uh, the Democrats don't care about us, we shouldn't turn out. That, you know, that is definitely a legitimate speech. So there's certainly some dicey First Amendment issues here. Uh, a lot of the most prominent examples in 2016 were not necessarily time, place, and manner restrictions like voting is on Wednesday rather than on Tuesday, but were more, uh, you know, content-based and misleading with regard to the identity uh, of the speaker. Yeah, so we'll get more into questions about the First Amendment and questions about uh, two, Section 230 um, in a few minutes, but I want to turn to Danielle. But before I do that, let me say, because I forgot to say, if you have questions for this group, please use the Q&A function on Zoom, and I'll try to get to your questions in the, the last part of our talk. Danielle. So thank, 
thanks so much, Rick, for having us. And it's oh, I'm always grateful to follow Nate and Spencer, um, and particularly Spencer, your remarks about the. Um, Rick knows I think about these issues as privacy issues, and so um, it's So your initial question, Rick, was what's different about today's you know 21st century lives in a networked age with social media, and what's different is that the massive amounts of our data collection imperative allows both advertisers, posters, impersonators, it, it gives the breadth of knowledge about at us and our vulnerabilities that can be exploited. And so it is the it is that the reservoirs of personal information that allow Facebook's algorithm. So to go back to, to Spencer's one, you know, important points about the ways in which algorithms shape our universe of, of the kind of information that we're seeing. And it allows for the kind of gaming um, and manipulation and exploitation of voters in ways that truly ch ch you know, change behavior, not just about sort of when you show up, as Spencer said, the sort of time, place and manner thing, right? But ways that give off signals that prevent people to dissuade people from voting in ways that are so finely tuned to who we are, our vulnerabilities, that allows for, the, it, it's unprecedented in the sense of our manipulation has never been easier, right? It has never been more informed. And so it is the massive amounts of data and what it says about us and our vulnerabilities and what we click to and what we react on that allow to game us in ways I think that we, I would say is, is and I'm gonna look to my election law experts here, but it seems unprecedented in many ways, right? Um, and so I do look forward to so that to me is what is so profoundly different is the way in which our data is used to game, exploit, manipulate us and, and, and to disenfranchise enfranchise us. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking about the First Amendment concerns about the source of the speech when that's misleading. That will be fun, um, as we see with deep fakes. And of course, always when you say Section 230, Rick, you know, certainly Spencer and I pop up, <laughs> right? Um, having written about it together and been thinking about it. So thank you so much for having us and talking to us. Sure. And if I could just follow up a little bit, you know, one of the uh, revelations that came out, I think it was just this week from the papers that have been uh, leaked by the Facebook whistleblower was, um, uh, I, I guess, uh, some uh, researcher working in Facebook had set up a, an account, a fictitious account as a uh, uh, Southern um, Republican Christian woman um, uh, who was a Trump supporter. And then within days, she was getting... Uh, uh, posts on uh, QAnon conspiracy and even uh, the three percenter militia group. Yeah. Um, what does this tell us about the ability of um, algorithms or those who um, program the algorithms to take us to a place that may not even be intended by anyone? Right. I mean, so if the raison d'etre of all these platforms is advertising, Right. And so we're optimized. The incentive is to optimize for likes, clicks and shares. And of course, designers of algorithms and, and um, then it turns through us. We know that what to sell, what sells negativity. Right. Um, uh, conspiracy theories. And in my world, sort of sex. Right. Salaciousness. And so gossip may be bad for us, extremism is bad for us, conspiracy theories are bad for us, but they're good for algorithms seeking likes, clicks, and shares. And so that is what, it was no surprise that within two days, the fake account, I, I forgot her name, Caroline something, Kathy, right, that she was led to QAnon in two days because we're going to be more likely to click on this extreme rhetoric, right, and, and, and so you just, you're, you're manipulated into liking, clicking and sharing, and we're going to feed you, you know, you might think like a diet of sugar <laughs> and fats are bad for us, right? These algorithms are tantamount to, they're equivalent to the fats and the sugars. They want us to engage with extreme ideas, the negativity, right? The screaming at each other, and that's what gets our attention. And so they're going to feed it to us. And I should say, uh, not to single out Facebook, we're singling out Facebook because that's where we're getting the information, but the same thing is right. happening on YouTube. We've seen experiments where um, clicking on uh, a video will bring you more and more extreme content uh, as, uh, as time goes on politically. 
So I want to get into the, since this is a panel, we're talking about disinformation with different groups. When we spoke to the um, election administrators, you know, we asked, you know, what can election officials do to spread reliable information and to deal with disinformation? Uh, but this is a group of, of law scholars. And so I do want to turn to the constitutional questions and the statutory questions. And I think maybe the way I would get at this is ask each of you um, if you could um, pick one or two laws that you think could help deal with the disinformation problem. Um, do you think that they would be effective? And do you think that they would be legal, both constitutionally as well as um, not filing Section 230 or some other provision of law? So uh, I don't know, um, Nate, do you want to kick this off on, you know, what, what kind of reform do you think should be at, uh, or a set of reform should be at the top of the agenda? So, um, well, look, the set of reforms at the top of the agenda, I've got a bill that I've written that, that uh, people are interested, just go to my Twitter uh, page at personally and you can, you can see it, but this is mainly on transparency. Um, but, but, but let me sort of agree with Danielle that you can get at the disinformation problem without regulating lies per se, right? So that you don't have to have a White House Office of Information Integrity, right? That would, would be policing lies on the internet. And I actually think out, because I'm convinced, having looked at a lot of this crap that's, that, that's, that's, that we're discussing here, that the, the truly false speech is often not the problem. And that's what people need to understand is that it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's, it's some of the stuff is non-falsifiable, it's polarizing, it's misinformation, it's, it's decontextualizing stuff. And so even if you did have a truth test, um, that is actually not going to solve uh, this problem. However, right, we, we need to know more about what's at, what, at the nature of the problem, what's actually going on. And so we need to, my view is that not even before these recent revelations, that Facebook and Google have lost their right to secrecy. They are not normal companies. They have to, they have an obligation now to show everything, basically, that they've got all the data that they are analyzing to some kind of outside uh, review. I'm concerned about the government doing it. And so that the proposal I have on the table is for outside independent researchers through a kind of National Science Foundation um, process of, of access. But the idea here is that if they are watched, then we will get a better handle on a lot of these questions and then they internally will change their behavior. Uh, like, so for example, this question about the role that the algorithm is playing, there is a, a right now there is like no middle ground. The politicians and, um, and conventional wisdom says that look, that the algorithm is polarizing people and that's leading people to disinformation and like. Uh, people at Facebook and YouTube say the exact opposite. Right, that it, that it is actually not. If anything, they are saying that it they the algorithm, particularly when it comes to political uh, content, uh, shifts people toward mainstream sources. Uh, um, no one should trust the platforms at this point, right? We need some kind of outside entity to do that review to get a sense of whether um, uh, social media, the algorithms, are actually leading people down rabbit holes and polarizing. I'll say one last thing, which which is going to be in my testimony tomorrow, which is that the that to some extent that. The, you gotta you gotta sort of break down the affordances of the platform and think about each each aspect differently. So I think there's a consensus I think within Facebook that's now been revealed and and uh, folks on the outside realize this also that recommendations of groups is is one of the big problems. So that that um, Facebook groups are where a lot of these kind of cauldrons of disinformation, polarization, and and mobilization are happening. Uh, that are quite dangerous. Uh, that's the reason they shut off groups uh, during the election um, uh, or the recommendations uh, for groups, but whether it's anti-vax or, 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 or election disinformation and the like, um, these groups are, are turn out to be really dangerous uh, places on the internet. And just pushing you on that point uh, before I'll, I'll turn next to Danielle, um, is, is the group's problem something that law handles? Or is this no. something that so 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 this comes because of public pressure or yeah. because of internal norms? Well, to... but yeah, but th this is where the, so I get some criticism by by focusing on the transparency. Like I don't want people to think that like my the this proposal that I've been floating is somehow a substitute for antitrust, privacy, you know, um, uh, other kinds of regulation. But it is unprecedented in that the firms will now know that they're being watched and it will change their behavior, right? And so. If Facebook groups are continuing to be 
uh, cauldrons of disinformation and, and polarization and hate speech and the like, um, that we will know about it and everybody will know about it. And then we, you won't have to wait for a whistleblower to whip blow her whistle before uh, people know about it. And I do think it will cha change the behavior. Whoops, and, and let me just ask you, uh, Nate, you said you're testifying. What what testimony, uh, before what hearing is that so that people who want to- Yeah, to, uh, and I put the testimony on my Twitter page if people are interested. Uh, um, it's a Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee hearing tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern, um, I, along with the great Marianne Franks and uh, Karen Kornbluth and uh, David Sifri from ADL are all, all testifying on like online harms. It's a very broad topic. Thanks. All right, Danielle. So, um, when you talk about your wish list and whether it would be you know, raise First Amendment problems, um, I also would like you to address yeah. the deep fakes issue, which you've written yeah. about. You're one of the early, early people sounding the alarm on this. If you could talk about that as well. Okay. So, you know, first things first on the least First Amendment allergic idea <laughs> that I do um, is to think, of course, about the curtailing the data collection imperative, right? So that that we have, our permission structure is such that companies in the United States can, it, the, the, the presumption is we can collect information, right? And then once we, we worry about it really down, way downstream, right? And the fact that we can, that it's behavioral advertising, it permits and enables the kind of manipulation and exploitation that we see, right? It leads to, and so Woody Hartsock had called it a sort of abusive design of systems, right? Um, and so I think first things first is we need a comprehensive, strong, not a process-based, or you can include the process, but far more than notice and presumed choice, right? That is, we need to live in a world where we have firm substantive limits on data collection and strong rules that really cabin how information can be used, right? So that, I think that is the least, though folks may disagree with me, um, but, but that may be the least sort of running right smack dab into the First Amendment, right? Um, we can talk about Section 230, though I don't know if you want us to wait to talk about it. Um, but maybe let's just start with you know deep fakes, right? So the digital manipulation of uh, that shows people doing and saying things that they never did or said, you know. In, so so you ask like, what are things on the wish list that we might, if we were to be able to regulate, that would be at least we have a plausible case that can, can we can write a statute that would pass muster uh, the crucible of strict scrutiny or the First Amendment, right? And so deep fakes are a version of defamation. Right, and so we have not yet. So what, what Bobby Chesney and I, when we first started writing about deep fakes in 2000, I think it was 17 or 18, um, what worried us, of course, was the deep fake deployed the night before an election, right? Showing a politician doing and saying things that they never did or said, and therefore you change the story of what happens the next day on election day. Um, deep, you know, depressed turnout, et cetera. And we just haven't really seen that, right? Where we've seen the malicious deep fakes are deep fake sex videos of women, right? Um, so the 60,000 deep fakes online, 97% of them are deep fake sex videos. And they're all basically of women's faces being inserted into porn, right? And so of course, so Marianne, so Dr. Franks and I have worked on, on behalf of the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, have, have worked on ways to think about how to um, uh, penalize the, posting of digitally altered or fabricated essentially impersonations, right? Or digital identity theft in ways that are harmful, that would be defamatory, right? And I think we could craft a statute. Is it gonna do a lot? You know, probably not as much as we might hope, right? You need to see it enforced. And, you know, I'm, I'm not bullish on the fact that we're gonna see laws like that enforced. I think we could write a statute that comports with the first amendment. The biggest problem of course are the platforms. And so that too is a problem for the First Amendment because a lot of the stuff we're talking about is the kinds of lies that we, in some respect, New York Times versus Sullivan have to tolerate, right? They're not, so I'm gonna, I'm thinking precisely of, of Rick and Spencer's work on, on deep fakes and then also the kinds of lies that we're seeing, which is go to the polls on X day, it's not true, right? Like those are the kinds of lies I think maybe you would agree that we can, we can penalize, right? Um, and it's same is true when it's tantamount to, dis to defamation, right? Um, the problem is a lot of these lies are, they're designed to manipulate 
and to discourage voting, but they are true, right? And so that is, they, they we're, we're gonna have to be hard pressed to penalize them in a way that's consistent with the First Amendment. And so even if I got my wish list on Section 230 and I'm gonna keep pressing for it, right? I'm not entirely sure that it necessarily, that is reasonable uh, steps to address illegality on platforms. And so I would condition um, Section 230's immunity for under filtering speech, Section 230C1, on have, taking reasonable steps to address illegality that causes harm. Just a lot of this information we're all talking about, right, is not an illegality, nor might we be able to, this goes back to Nate's in, the wonderful point, like we may not be able to, right, render it illegal and consistent with our commitments under the First Amendment. So I think even in a world in which we change Section 230, right, except for, and Spencer, this goes to the stuff that you've been writing and thinking about, um, you know, Spencer has lots of really interesting and important thoughts on civil rights laws, right, and carve outs for Section 230 or ways in which taking reasonable steps it's not reasonable, right, to do this sort of um, algorithmic tinkering that would effectively violate civil rights laws. So I don't mean to pass the ball to you, Spencer, but it, it, I feel like it opens the door to your important work on Section 230 and civil rights commitments. Let's go right there, Spencer. Okay, well, you know, I was going to hold on 230, but I'm ready to go. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so... Um, some of the ideas that I have proposed, as well as other scholars like Olivier uh, Sylvain, uh, have involved a carve out for civil rights. In other words, Facebook has argued that when it targets or delivers ads along racial lines for housing or employment, let's say away from black folks and toward white folks, they basically say they're immune under 230, that they have no responsibility, no liability. They don't have to comply with federal civil rights laws. A similar argument could be made with uh, discrimination in the voting context, such as targeting voter suppression at, at uh, black communities. Uh, our argument is that there should be a carve out for uh, civil rights uh, laws, just as there is a carve out for other areas like federal criminal law or intellectual property. Uh, certainly, uh, the motion picture, uh, you know, industry is incredibly important, uh, but so are, you know, uh, you know, marginalized communities are important as well. And, and, and are, uh, um, I think another important component here, that's kind of one half of it. Another half is, as we look at some of the reforms promoted by President Trump, they would essentially hinder responsible content moderation. They would take out uh, and, and frankly neuter the otherwise objectionable, uh, the ability for platforms to take down content that is so-called otherwise objectionable here. And so I think we, we don't want to go down that path. We wanna encourage uh, platforms and you know that they keep their uh, section uh, 230 uh, uh, immunity uh, when they engage in responsible content moderation. Now, I want to make a couple more just quick points. One, agree with disclosure. It's incredibly important. We don't know what's going on. Agree with Danielle in terms of, of strong rules in, in this uh, uh, point and kind of build on something she said earlier in terms of we're not really, with regard to these platforms, we're really not talking about free speech. What's what they're focused on is clicks. They're focused on dollars. That is what's driving them. It's not a particular position that they are taking. It's clicks and money. And the market is not going to deal with this issue. If you look at, for example, like TV, you know, obviously we've got the FCC, but also we've got major advertisers that are like big spenders here, and they're not going to, um, you know, they're not going to advertise against, uh, you know, child, you know, pornography or adult pornography or other things, right? There, there are market reasons uh, that curtail as well with regard to other other platforms. That really doesn't exist here. You know, there are, there are a lot of other advertisers that participate. 
these clicks is just really an attract it's the business model here right so we've got to be be frank with that and and also the companies often talk about self-policing hey we can uh, engage in, in self-policing and you know as we see from francis haugen's documents you know th that hasn't been uh, effective and I, i'd hearken back to a couple of other industries you know obviously there was a Cotton gin, new innovation, 1794 or so, right? And, you know, cotton was the, you know, accounted for over half of our exports for the first six decades of the 1800s uh, here. You know, we quickly became a global superpower, economic superpower as a result of that, right? Uh, but uh, obviously there are some consequences that were associated with that in terms of, using unpaid slave labor to displace India and China. And we continue to live with the cost of that. Similarly, we look at kind of the industrial revolution and, and, and major life-changing great things that have occurred, but right now we're, we're grappling with climate change uh, as a result of externalized costs uh, that were not internalized by these industries here. And so we really do need law and some kind of external force so that you know, companies are externalizing or are internalizing these costs and so that we're not paying for them for generations into the future. I just wanna follow up quickly um, back to your earlier point about a section 230 carve out for civil rights laws. Right. So what would that allow more specifically, how would that deal with, say, the problems we saw in 2016 compared to the current legal regime that we have? Yeah, I think it would basically mean that you don't get to argue that we don't even need to go into court, right? You'd still have to prove an underlying violation. And as you know, the Voting Rights Act and federal law really does not, it prevents voter suppression through intimidation but not through uh, deception, right? That, that's, there's no you know, deceptive federal deceptive practices law in the books right now. Now, there are many states that have deceptive practices uh, uh, laws, and there are questions about the constitutionality of some of those that would go to kind of First Amendment issues. However, uh, deceptive practices law that's exclusively focused on time, place, and manner, uh, I think the court would, would likely uphold that. And so if a Facebook uh, delivered ads along racial lines here in terms of deceptive practices ads and it violated a state deceptive practice uh, uh, law uh, here, then, you know, they have to actually go in court and make some arguments. Now, there may not be the intent, there may they all the elements may not be uh, met, right? But at least they can't just say, hey, we don't even have to show up in court because, hey, Section 230, we don't even have to have a conversation about our role in this. And, and, and I'm sorry, I do want to make one more point, which is that the point of 230 is basically to allow third parties to post and the companies not be liable, which is great from a speech standpoint, right? And that made sense when 230 was enacted, definitely, right? But right now the companies are engaging, they're, they're material participants, they're making material contributions to these problems through their ad targeting and delivery. Many of the third party users don't even know who's receiving the information. So in terms of the data collection and the development of algorithms and targeting messages toward particular communities, uh, the companies are, are, are very much involved. They're making a material contribution much in the way the platform in the, in the case roommates uh, was making a material contribution to the discrimination uh, there, uh, where they basically uh, allow people to uh, connect with roommates who maybe had a similar sexual orientation or, or, or something, you know, to that effect, or, or folks with, without children, uh, in, in these things violated uh, California uh, state uh, law. 
I want to turn to your questions in a minute. Uh, there are some great questions. You can still add them to the Q&A. Uh, I won't get to all of them, but I will try and get to as many as I can. But first, I wanted to turn to Nate um, and get his take on uh, where Section 230 fits into these questions. So I think that the discussion globally about Section 230 has kind of turned Section 230 into more of a metaphor for everything that's wrong with the internet, as opposed to being specifically about the liability shield that is 230. And so we got a question in the chat about just to explain 230, right? That 230 is, is designed in order to, as, as Spencer said, to prevent the platforms from, or actually, and let's be specific, to prevent any website um, that, that hosts user-generated content from being liable for that content. And also it's trying to incentivize, as Danielle said, um, good Samaritan takedowns of, of content um, that themselves might be, you know, constitutionally protected speech, but that you can't be sued if you're a platform for taking down certain certain types of uh, offending content. Um, and so, I, you know, I sort of feel like we, we shouldn't buy into the kind of limited scope of CDA 230 and thinking just about the liability provisions when we think about internet regulation, um, because, you know, it may be as a general rule, we wanna, we wanna shield the platforms from liability, but let's regulate them for, to further civil rights. Let's regulate them to deal with non-consensual seg uh, sexual imagery. Let's regulate them to deal with political advertising. It's like, you can call that a 230 problem, I guess, but, but really let's just, you know, let's regulate the companies um, to uh, try to, to prevent some of these societal dangers. And I would say, you know, one thing that does concern me is that we, we need to focus on Facebook and Google um, and, and be careful about increasing the costs on small websites, right, that could potentially challenge them. Uh, and that also, um, you know, are, because Section 230 applies to the whole internet. It's not just about uh, the big firms. And so I think we really need to, to, to kind of be targeted in thinking about both the problems conceptually and then the, the, the abusers of it, right? And so um, to go after the big platforms and make sure uh, that the laws that we pass are going to actually solve these particular problems. And, and like I said, not be limited to thinking about 230, which is just about liability. There are things for which, you know, if we repealed 230 tomorrow, there's a lot of terrible stuff that would exist on Facebook and Google and the like, right? And so we need to sort of expand the lens beyond 230 and the kind of liability discussion to focus specifically on regulation. I like your point. Oh, go ahead, Danielle. But to be fair, Section 230 prevents those meaningful conversations. Like we we can't talk about federal laws with civil penalties vis-a-vis -vis section, we, we've got Section 230, right? And we could, of course, pass a federal criminal law that deals with platforms, right? But really, <laughs> we're going to do that? No. And, 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 you know, so our work on the non-consensual intimate imagery question, right, is really goes after posters, right? And so um, we do need to, it's not that we, you're right, we have a lot of heavy lifting to do because there's so much that, you know, we, we live in a world of deregulation when it comes to the internet. It was a choice that we made in 96, remember Bryn, right? Um, they say to state AGs in 1998, trust us, we won't be evil. You don't need to regulate us vis-a-vis -vis the collection of data. That was the dumbest thing, we got hoodwinked. They did. I mean, perhaps the incentives were different at the time. They didn't know that they would be, you know, that 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 monetizing all of that data would be their agenda, right? Three years later. But, but Danielle, but, that is exactly. So let's let's regulate that. That's not a two, what you just mentioned, right? That's not oh, really no, a no. thirty problem. So, guess, so let's but, like go after but that. But there are two that, pieces, right? That that yeah. happened all at the same time, right? The choice in '98 not to have, um, uh, impose a comprehensive privacy law vis-a-vis -vis companies, right? Yeah. Was part of the story that the pitch from Silicon Valley lobbyists made, which is hands off. This is all about free speech. Spencer put it so right, correctly. Like it's not about speech. It's likes, clicks and shares, it's money, right? The idea we've now seen the lie for what it is. That is Zuckerberg doesn't really care about free speech. He wants to make, well, no one's surprised. His shareholders aren't surprised. They're, I'm sure, happy about it, right? Um, that that it is not about free speech and wanting to host third-party content, right? They want to make money off of behavioral advertising, right? So I do just, I think you're right that we have a lot of lifting to do in terms of if we want to 
disinformation related to elections that's harmful that we might be able to regulate we got to pass those laws right but we've got first things first if it's not a federal criminal law does that make sense nate so that's why i just yeah well no but take something like the honest ads act right which i'm sure you know Spencer rick uh, written about this a little bit right all right so is that a section 230 law or is that i mean it, it, i mean if if if, if that's right. a section 230 law then that then i don't then think so well, right isn't it like it, well, it is about that's, i don't think it is publishing or speaking information provided by another interactive computer service provider do you know what I'm saying? like just it's not about publishing someone else's speech right so well, it's it's about well, that, so I maybe agree with you know you. the law better than I. No, 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 I do. But assuming but, 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 but no, that, part, yeah, part of it is is just trying to figure out what we're throwing. It, and, and I don't mean mean to make this just a semantic discussion. I mean, part of what I'm I'm saying is we need to be bolder than two thirty reform, right? Really? Which is that we need to go much farther. And that it's like we that that to some extent we buy into this debate that it's just a liability for individual speech as opposed to all right, let's like regulate the structure of the internet That's and right. make sure that we we. Um, you know, toward the positive ends of equity and, and inclusion and, and, and free speech for that matter, right? So, I mean, that's, that's right. when we talk about hate speech, right? And you've written about this as well. It's, it's also about how online people are being intimidated into silence, right? And so that, you know, I agree with you all. It's not, you know, just all about speech here and, and that but we, we should think about regulation, whether it's privacy, antitrust um, or advertising, uh, as a, in a holistic way that doesn't just focus on you know liability for user generated content. Yeah, I want to let Spencer get a word in here, and then uh, I'm going to turn to the questions. So just just quickly, uh, one I agree with you that we do need to be bold in the 230 reform. I I would say even though I'm a big fan of disclosure, I would also say that we need you know disclosure may not be enough uh, here. Yeah, I can't tell you what it is, but you know disclosure. Right? One thing you talked about the size of uh, platforms and, and not just focusing on, on Facebook or, or Google. And, and I agree with you. I did want to kind of turn back to Danielle because the kind of come back to 230 reform, you know, I think she, a lot of her thinking has contemplated the differences in size and, and uh, accounted for that. Maybe Danielle, let me just kind of turn it over to you. Yeah, yeah. So reasonable steps would that approach would, of course, what's reasonable for me is different from what's reasonable for thee, sort of thing, right? So when you have Facebook, you are dealing with its resources. What's reasonable for a, a company of the size of Facebook with the money at its disposal and the harms and the legality that it's facing is different from what's reasonable for a small blog, right? And so that is the notion that we condition the legal shield for filtering too little on reasonable steps absolutely like takes into consideration what's reasonable is something that you know think about what the FTC has done vis-a-vis -vis data security it has come up with an approach to reasonable security in its policy statements in its consent decrees which takes an account of size and vol right like that is what's reasonable depends upon the context so I've tried to convince Spencer to agree. I think I've got you on board with my reasonable steps proposal because you definitely have me on board with the carve out for civil rights laws because we've worked on that together. But um, so I think, you know, when we, I feel like we so often have these blinders about everything on ones and zeros online that it's all free speech, right? And of course, all these pathologies are so much more than speech, right? And so, I think 230 reform has to be part of the conversation, but absolutely it's not the only conversation. And Spencer, as you said, disclosure is, it can't be the only thing, right? But I feel like we're happy to throw a lot of tomatoes in the wall with all of us the here in this, in this little square I'm seeing. All right, I, I promised that I would get to questions. So I wanna at least get to one as we only have 10 minutes left and the time is passing quickly. But before I do that, I wanna uh, just pass along a note that Paul Ryan of the camp, uh, of the uh, Common Cause passed along that tomorrow they're um, going to be releasing a major report entitled, as a matter of fact, the harms caused by election disinformation. So if you're interested in that, uh, head over to the Common Cause website tomorrow. 
So uh, I want to turn to one of the questions in the chat, uh, which is a broad question, which is, uh, should we revive the fairness doctrine? Should we require platforms to be even handed in how they handle content, whether that's about algorithms or about, you know, some other way of regulating speech or, you know, take it from the other side. Um, should there be laws that as Florida has just passed and has now been put on hold, uh, preventing the deplatforming of politicians uh, or uh, viewpoint discrimination? So. What do we think? Uh, and let's put the Section 230 issue aside and assume that that's not a barrier. Um, good policy, bad policy, um, First Amendment problem to have. Bad. Bad. It's bad. Okay. <laughs> Tell me why. Yeah. Wait, with these, no, it's, right, it's not it, the it, lightning it, round yet. So you actually have to give your answer. Oh, okay. I have a, I have a piece I'm writing for this uh, volume that <laughs> Jeff Stone and uh, Lee Bollinger are editing, which, which talks about this. And you know, I mean, one of the things about that Florida law, yeah, deplatforming of individuals, right? And then they define a platform in a way that um, excludes any any corporation that owns a theme park in Florida. So, you know, that that's that's like if I were teaching, you know, in my First Amendment class, that that's would the tell Disney you what, exception what, to the Constitution. Yeah, the Disney exception, right? <laughs> no, no. I mean, look, the, the you, all right, you you, you um, there are this goes back to the Good Samaritan kinds of uh, provisions or incentives in CDA two thirty which is that there are, you want certain circumstances, you want the platforms to be able uh, to act uh, in ways that if they were the state, it would violate the first amendment, right? Because most of the stuff that we've been talking about right now, disinformation, hate speech and the like, even some incitement, right? Is protected under the first amendment. So if you convert them into what seems like quasi state actors, right? Then, then um, they're gonna be hobbled and getting after these. Now the, fair, the fairness doctrine, I think is completely unadministrable on the internet. I don't even know really yeah. how you would characterize yeah. each, you know, post and then have a, you know, an equal put, you know, post next to it. Leave that aside. Um, the deplatforming of politicians during a campaign is I think a kind of interesting problem. I think that maybe there could be a law in the kind of spirit of public utility regulation, antitrust regulation that would say, you know, we don't want the big platforms um, putting their thumb on the scales uh, in an election. That's a kind of interesting thing. But the, the Florida law is way too broad. It goes, you know, off the deep end. Danielle or Spencer on this question? Fair, new fairness doctrine? Spencer, I mean, you've got, so er, you got Erman yeah, Chemerinsky and Justice Thomas both kind of on the same side here. You know, they're not just three networks, right? Like they're just so many platforms. I mean, it's just, you, you can't manage that uh, would be my thought from a fairness doctrine standpoint. Now, uh, on this other piece in terms of the Florida law, and this kind of and you're there to, in Florida. I don't know you having a particular right, investment exactly. in this right now, but right, right. <laughs> um, you know, I've been teaching this case prune yard and property for years, right? And it's kind of a progressive case that basically mandates that people can leaflet uh, here. New Jersey also has this law at malls, right? Conservatives have always been so hostile to prune yard or you know any of these cases because you know the thought here is that the mall or whatever there's a private entity this isn't about speech there's not a government actor here right and that that's really what we're seeing and the point of 230 on one hand is i'm not liable for this third party speech so we're going to have a lot of speech but it's also, if you're going to engage in content moderation, you can. You can take down hate speech. You can take down, you know, a speech that is, is bullying or intimidating or harassing, whatever. Yeah. You're empowered to do that as a platform. We want you to do that. And really, politicians are looking for a free pass to engage in yeah. disinformation, to, yeah. you know, do a variety of, of, of things here. And so my thought is we want platforms to be able to engage in responsible content moderation and, and that these state laws are, are problematic. And they're also problematic from a First Amendment uh, standpoint right. in terms of the platforms in and of themselves. Danielle, did you have anything you wanted to add or you're just uh, gonna- uh... I'm in heated agreement, right? I mean, I think with both of them. Um, and what's, what's interesting is I'm with Spencer. I don't want them to not moderate, right? Like it's not a world I'm using. Like I'm not already don't really use lots of these tools anymore, but it's, I am definitely not using any of these social networks, right? Without moderation. 
right? And I think we want, I want to, I, we do a lot of work with, in terms of advising companies at CCRI to like moral suasion. Like these are the sorts of, I want them doing that, right? I don't want them to stop. It's, we want an internet that's workable, livable, spam free, Nazis, right? At least for me, you know, free of this sort of awful hate speech that would turn me off and intimidate me on offline. So um, I think that's that's right. It, okay. All right, last question. I have a few minutes, so this will be more of a lightning round. It's a great question. Uh, the questioner asks, since January 6th, the percentage of Republican voters who believe the false claim that the 2020 election was stolen has actually increased significantly. How could this massive failure of narrative control have been prevented? Can this partially be remedied now or is it too late? So quick answers from any of you. Uh, very easy question. Is there something that could have been done? Nate. Well, look, this is a kind of classic public opinion um, dynamic, right? So if, if there was a more complicated message that was coming from the Republican side with respect to the um, election fraud, then you wouldn't have as such a big shift and how this will correlate with partisan identity. This is kind of a John Zoller uh, sort of uh, argument. Um, but when you have elites that are basically either being silent or coalescing around that message, there's very little that could be done uh, to respond, right? Because if you, have, if you have mainstream media and you have Democrats who are saying, no, no, the election was fair, but if you have Republican leaders who are saying that it was fraudulent, you're not going to end up with um, uh, you know, a way of complicating the, the, the move of Republican voters toward that message. And so what, what, where do we go from here? On that? Downward. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I think, part, here's the thing, now to make you even more pessimistic about the future, <laughs> um, I'm worried that this is actually gonna become more bipartisan in the next year because um, that, that the loss of confidence in the infrastructure is going to start, uh, that, that Democrats also are gonna start mm -hmm. um, uh, believing in this. And that's because, um, part of it is because for legitimate uh, concerns about vote suppression, and laws and the like, but but if the Republicans uh, gain control of Congress next year, which seems likely, I could easily see Democrats having their own kind of version of loss of confidence uh, in the election infrastructure. Danielle or Spencer, any thoughts on this question? No. Spencer, you want to go first? Want me to go? It's just the most, it's tough to be around, I have to say the smartest election law scholars, not me, I'm talking about my company, that I feel the weight, right, of it's just depressing to think that when you have, you know, mainstream outlets, right, sort of marching the party line that we can't just, we can't trust um, elections and that, that we might in fact have even more of that, that is we're going to get buy-in on both sides, bipartisanship there. It's we already, our trust is so low already, like Pew, all these studies about trusting government is already. So it's amazing, like the bottom just keeps falling in many ways. All right, Spencer, you get the last word and hopefully you're gonna say yeah, something uplifting because this is a terrible way to end. It's a little <laughs> more optimistic than Nate's, which is that another way for this to go is I think there is a real discussion within the Republican Party kind of about the future and kind of grappling with, 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 with truth and a real debate, an internal debate. You know, certainly Democrats had a similar debate uh, with regard to civil rights and voting uh, in the 1960s. And there was a particular faction there that, that won out. Now, obviously there were some incredible political shifts as a result of that, but that, that Dixiecrat kind of other Democrat debate was uh, significant and, and folks kind of stepped up to the plate. And I, and I think that, you know, hopefully uh, some of these issues will be grappled with within the Republican Party as opposed to just kind of everyone joining in on this, which is a possibility uh, here. Uh, it's just a, a, more, pop, a more pessimistic uh, option. Well, Daniel Citron, Nate Persley, Spencer Overton, it's always great to see you. Um, maybe we can have a happy discussion next time about uh, uh, puppies and, and uh, rainbows yeah. or something, but, uh, but here we are. <laughs> Ice thank cream. You for, thank you for sharing your wisdom. <laughs> Let me remind you all that uh, the third in our series, which will feature the views of social scientists, which 
I may or may not be even more pessimistic than this. Uh, will be on November 10th, moderated by Pam Fessler. You can go to law.uci.edu slash F-E-F-S to sign up for that free event. Thank you all. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.